Yeah, so yeah, so this will be recorded. Um, so it's basically on the record. Uh, so don't say anything you don't want anyone to know that you said it. Uh, and just as a brief reminder, please stay on mute unless you're speaking, uh, just to minimize background noise. Uh, so I, I, I thought what we would start with, uh, uh, I thought what we would start with on the, uh, the text is the, uh, the intellectual property chapter uh, or the intellectual property provisions, I would say, because it's not like an IP chapter per se. And to get people's reactions to how those things were um, were handled, um, I'd like you to kind of go through the text the way that it's kind of presented in the zero draft. And I'd start with the with the uh, 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 the preamble. The preamble uh, mentions uh, either intellectual property or the trips in articles thirty-seven. I, I should say paragraphs thirty-seven through forty-six. It's just a whole a series of uh, mentions about that. And uh, a lot of the uh, text are, are probably taken from other uh, agreed upon uh, documents. Does anyone uh, feel like they'd like to comment on, on the sort of references to intellectual property that are in the preamble of the zero draft text in these paragraphs? Uh, uh, 37 through 46. Okay, that's gonna be pretty short. No one really <laughs> has an opinion on the, the references in the preamble. Uh, I think Roger has his hands up. Who has? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Roger from WTO and Ellen. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. I have to look at the, at the different pages here. So I'm gonna go first with Roger uh, Pamp from um, WTO. Uh, you're you're on mute. You, I, I, does anyone hear him? I don't hear him. No, I do not. Uh, we'll come we'll come back. But right now we we can't hear you at all, Roger. So if you can figure out what's wrong with the audio, then we'll we'll come right back to you. Um, you said Moga had a comment on. Um, it was Ellen. Ellen has Ellen, her hand. Ellen, up. yeah. Okay, Ellen. What what are your thoughts on the, these? Uh, references to IP in the preamble. But, well, just very quickly, of course, it signals that these are issues that will be addressed in, in the operative paragraph. So that's you know it's a nice clear signal early in the document. As you said, a lot of the text is is text that is sort of agreed upon text that we know from other other agreements or other uh, other or, or resolutions. Um, and 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 of course there's there's a lot of uh, resonance of the Doha Declaration on Trips and Public Health. Um, but what struck me, um, which I found interesting, is in Article 43, where there is a direct reference to um, options and solutions that should not be based on a charity model. And that's, of course, something that member states raised in the sort of pre-negotiation meetings that many of us have also been, uh, been part of, that... Uh, they're seeking more sustainable solutions that aren't based on what actually happened during the COVID-19 uh, or happens during the COVID-19 where countries just have to wait until others are ready to give a give a handout. So I, I thought that was useful to have that there fairly, uh, fairly early on. So this is just a, a brief comment on that. Uh, uh, Brooke, you have your hand up? Yes, just very quickly, I would have liked to see something on the benefits of open science. Um, there's, there is such discussion later in the text, but there's nothing in this section about how IP management actually might benefit um, open science. And there's also not a focus here nor throughout the text on um, the need to develop products that are well adapted for use in resource poor settings, which just seems to be a missed opportunity, but it should be in the preamble as well. Oh, that's great. Uh, do, do, any other comments on the references in the preamble, the intellectual property, which are currently in paragraphs 36, 37 through 46? Uh, Josh, uh, uh, Joshua uh, Sarnoff, Professor Sarnoff. <laughs> Josh is fine, Jamie. Uh, 
I, it was just interesting to me that there was no direct reference uh, linking intellectual property and technology transfer, particularly trade secrecy. Um, and similarly, um, there was no discussion of the use of intellectual property to limit uh, or other measures to limit distribution to uh, particular countries where production has occurred. Um, and there was an, another issue, which I've now forgotten, but um, those are, I, I think it's just notable that it's not as clear as it could be as to what the actual concerns are. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Professor uh, Sarno. Are there other, uh, uh, Ellen, you have a hand yeah, up again. Just a quick, in, in, in response to that, there is there are references to the need for sustainable mechanisms to support technology transfer and know-how in 44 and in, um, let me see, I think 45, 46. Right. My, my only point is, is it's not linked to the intellectual property and particularly to the know-how and trade secrecy as explicit. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, uh, I didn't mention it, but, but uh, well, I, I guess, I guess 47, um, 47 is also, I guess, kind of an IP provision because it re refers to the need for conditionalities on publicly funded research. I think uh, 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 Josh, you you and Ellen have your hand up, but I assume that's you've already spoken, right? Uh, so I will I will go to uh, uh, a little bit further down the text in article Article Seven of the uh, Zero Draft. In Article Seven. The title of its access to technology, promoting sustainable and equally distributed production and transfer of technology and know-how. And this is, uh, this is gonna be obviously a really uh, challenging part of the negotiation. And uh, <clears throat> uh, it's organized into, uh, it's uh, five different paragraphs with some sub paragraphs. And, I'd like, if you can, if you're looking at the text, to to see if people have any comments on the first paragraph. Uh, paragraph. This says that uh, uh, the parties recognize inadequate ac access, including but not limited to. They mentioned vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics, and that and they relate that to increased manufacturing capacity. Uh, that is equitably geographically and strategically distributed. Does that seem about right to people, that first paragraph? Uh, Luis, you have a, your hand up. Luis Villarán from, uh, from Chile. No, just, no, sorry, it, my, my comment is uh, from the previous one uh, on the intellectual property and the preamble. Uh, I thought that it was missing a, a reference to, to, to the flexibilities for research which was not uh, uh, DNC uh, expressly, uh, particularly considering the need of uh, exceptions to copyright uh, for, you know, uh, external data mining and, and research in general that's needed for public health. Oh, okay, I, I think the same issue will come up in this operative text as well. Um, thank you, Brooke, you have your hand up on, on, on um, article seven, paragraph one. Yes, uh, mainly because it refers very abstractly uh, to expanded manufacturing capacity without differentiating between company controlled, you know, satellite plants and independent uh, manufacturing capacity, what we would think of as generic production. And that's, that's very significant because it's a big piece of what Big Pharma is planning going forward is the establishment of satellite facilities uh, and, and arguing that that satisfies the local production aspirations, uh, as opposed to establishing uh, independent companies that can, can can actually, you know, not be subject to pharma control. Thank you, Professor Baker. Uh, uh, Professor Sarnoff. Uh, I remember, thanks to Lewis, the point that the preamble also doesn't actually link the open access to the pathogens 
to the intellectual property rights and benefit sharing that uh, the products from evaluating the open pathogens are need to be shared widely. Thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, for people that are, are logging on the call, it would be really helpful if if you could edit the way your name is presented to put the, the affiliation that you're associated with. So uh, people, because not everyone knows and knows everyone on the call here. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Glarame, is it Sintra from IFPMA? Thank you, Jamie. So our main concern with this paragraph is just that uh, links inequitable access with uh, manufacturing and distribution. Uh, this can certainly be a concern. It's not the only. So it, the link is true one way. It's the only factor pretty much. At least that's how I read in this paragraph. And we know that access is uh, addressed by multiple factors. So if you were to rewrite that, what, how would you, how would you, uh, what would you, how would you do it? I would put at least some qualifiers that uh, one of the uh, aspects, uh, but not like uh, should be addressed by increased manufacturer the only way you are addressing. Uh, at least that's how I read the, the paragraph. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Josh, your hand is still up. Is that um, have you already spoken on this one? No? Okay. Next, I'd like to go to the second paragraph of Article 7. It says, uh, the parties working through the governing body shall strengthen existing and develop innovative uh, multilateral mechanisms to provide, that promote and incentivize relevant transfer of technology and know-how for production on mutually agreed terms to capable manufacturers. And I've heard people say that uh, they thought that mutually agreed terms, uh, some people were kind of focused on that. Some people were focused on what is a capable manufacturer. That's actually, I think, defined in the definitions. Um, but do people have any comments on this paragraph the way it is? To me, this paragraph is fine, but uh, other people may have some thoughts on it. Paragraph two. Uh, Moga from Oxfam. <clears throat> I'm not from Oxfam. I'm sorry. Formerly, <laughs> uh, for, formerly a box fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Those vaccine yeah. Alliance. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I just, just sorry, it is about the first paragraph, just to say that it is critical. Uh, one, what Brooke said, but also, um, um, what, sorry, I, I forgot your name, I said from um, the other speaker. I think I mean, we all know that at the beginning of any pandemic, you need to maximize production because the supply is going to be short. Whether it's one company that produced whatever it is or two or five, if you want it for everybody on the planet, then you need to maximize manuf manufacturing capacity and, and, and maximizing it. And I don't know how to write it. Maximizing capacity doesn't happen today when you have a pandemic. It happens before that before you have a pandemic. I don't know how you... Uh, 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 would you would you say, that, Moga, that if it, it was to say, instead of by increasing manufacturing capacity, it would say by ensuring there's uh, um, adequate capacity to meet the needs or something like that? Yeah, except I, I don't like ensuring that one with, you know, the, the vague word, the increasing is the same. It's kind of like vague. I, what I would like is a real commitment, particularly that this is an article, not preamble when you say um, kind of general things, but here there is there is there should be some commitment from all governments to invest in manufacturing before pandemics happen. Uh, Brooke, you have your hand up on this part. I can I can th I can think of a language, but uh, you know. Well, you know, it, it doesn't really promise an actual result. It says <clears throat> she'll, she'll strengthen, um, you know, what seems like something by promoting and incentivizing. That, that doesn't necessarily, you know, it, it means you'll try, um, but whether it'll work. And I think, you know, we're going to talk about this lots of times, but I wonder whether colleagues agree that the addition of, of on mutually agreed terms 
really does suggest the need for voluntary agreement. Um, it, you know, it's kind of an, you know, throughout the text is how much is, is this really focusing on voluntary licensing technology transfer according to, you know, the dictates in part of, of pharma and, you know, the, all the consequences that flow from that uh, historically. Yeah, so I think what you're suggesting is mutually agreed terms refers to an agreement between governments and companies as opposed to agreements between parties. Is that, is that that's how you read it? Um, I, I don't agree with that with that way. I think it. I, I hear it to, to promote and incentivize transfer of technology, the transfer itself to be on mutually agreeable terms between the tech holder and the tech recipient, and if it's subject to that voluntary to mutually agreeable terms, that means pharma will be able to dictate conditions, um, you know, uh, perhaps. Yeah, I think other people, I think, have shared that uh, interpretation as well, yeah. Warren uh, Kaplan. Uh, Hi. Professor, is it Professor Kaplan or you have to tell Yeah, me? you can call me Professor, you can call me Warren. Um, I wonder if people have a problem with the word developing countries, uh, whether that's defined anywhere. You know, I always have a problem with that, uh, what that really means. So I don't know whether it's defined anywhere. Thanks. Okay, good. We have a, uh, uh, do I say? Um, it's Nitin. Nitin. Yes. Nitin from GWN. Yes. Thank you. Uh, actually, I was, I mean, this paragraph actually goes against the basic understanding why we are having a treaty in the first place, because we really want a legally binding mechanism for, you know, diversification and production. And if this is going to be just strengthening of existing business models and mechanisms, uh, it, it doesn't really, you know, this is not why we are having a call for an Article 19 instrument as such. So, and then going back to the mutually agreed terms, of course, you know, it is, it is very important to understand that this term would transactionalize, uh, you know, transfer, transfer of technology and products at the point of time when, every, when, when an emergency is going on, which is what basically the developed countries say that you don't want when it comes to sharing of information. So, you know, <laughs> this is absolutely discriminatory on one side. So we have to be very clear that this is not what we want. Okay, uh, uh, I have a, uh, Peter, is that, how do I say your name from Oxfam? Peter, Peter is fine. Uh, thank you. I'd like to follow up on what Brooke said and also others before. Uh, that it reads for me like more of a tech transfer within the private sector. So if we will have just private, the cooperation in private sector, then it will not change much because it still will, it will be corporations in developing countries owning the technology and still selling the end products to the highest bidders just as, as it happened during this pandemic. So I think that more emphasis should be put in the text on the fact that it must be governments in developing countries who are in able to control the technology, who can adapt the technology to local needs and who there then are in charge of distributing and products. And this is still missing, I think. Thank you. I think I, I, I think as we go through the text, uh, you, you may find some other provisions re related to what might be considered uh, a measure to promote or incentivize. So it may not be uh, as as completely, you know, you know, if you look at it, you know, in the context of some other measures. But yeah, uh, I mean, I think what what Oxfam just said is what uh, several groups have sort of said when they look at that paragraph. But let's go back. To, let's go to, if we can. The next paragraph is, is a little complicated, but it's really, really important. It has a, a, a paragraph three, it's, it's the intra pandemic times measures that you're supposed to take. Now, uh, this article seven, it sort of splits things into like, what do you do when there's not an emergency and what do you do in the time uh, when there is an emergency? And, so does anyone want to take a comment on any of the four A, B, C, or D paragraphs? I mean, parts of paragraph paragraph three. I don't know exactly the right way to say it. I mean, like this article seven, number three, it's got these A, B, C, D parts. That do, does anyone have any comments on those? Uh, I, I, I can... Uh, 
I mean, I, I, again, you have a lot of stuff, coordinate, collaborate, facilitate, incentivize, mutually agreed terms, hubs, partners, strengthening, coordinate, mapping, manufacturing, capacity and demand. Encourage those that receive significant public funding, collaborate to ensure an uh, equitable and affordable access. I, I think those are all, uh, I think people know what those words mean, but uh, I'm gonna go through, I got a couple hands up. I'm gonna go to Melissa first, followed by Miriam. Hi, so this is, I guess, a question and not a comment, just including timely matching of supply to demand and mapping manufacturing capacities and demand. Like, what does that mean? Which, which, the language which, doesn't which, quite... which paragraph? One, mean, right? uh, three, well, where are we? Sorry, I just lost my screen. Does anyone have it handy? Here we go. Uh, 3B, that's round three, right? Am I, am I losing my mind? Yeah, timely matching the supply to demand, right? Yeah, I just I don't understand what that means. So timely matching during the pre pandemic for demand that we don't so for the times that aren't in the pandemic, we're matching supply for a product that we don't know what we'll need to demand for a product that we again don't know what we'll need. Is this for like use of capacity, like use of pandemic capacity for kind of normal like is this is this is this part of the, you know, factories that are making vaccines for pandemics should be repurposing to making you know, pneumococcal vaccines during non-pandemics. Like it's just, it's super vague. I don't know what it means. And well, I think, I'm also confused by the increasing um, coordination on mapping manufacturing capacity done by those agencies, because you can't increase something that they don't do. Just that's just not done at all. No one's doing it. So just the idea that you're strengthening something that's not there is, is a little interesting. Um, Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to, uh, I have some thoughts, but I'm going to go to Miriam first. Um, um, I take her, her, her comments first. We'll take a few comments on this and, and then we'll. Thanks. Miriam, go ahead. Yeah, so so just briefly on this, you know, you, you uh, mentioned the coordinate, strengthen, encourage, collaborate. As I went through the whole document, there are only, you know, a couple of places where the word compulsory is used or a stronger term is used. But it's very difficult then, you know, when you look at this to to understand where the teeth are in um, what WHO uh, is, you know, will will try to make happen or or even recommend. Um, they, these words are really very weak, and as we know, um, they, you know, it was very difficult uh, during during the pandemic as a result of that. Uh, connected to that, I think the the, the broader issue um, that Richard Horton, uh, our editor in chief, asked asked me to mention is that there is a lack overall. That this relates to. Um, no independent accountability mechanism. There, there's a lot of strength in the document to WHO's uh, accountability mechanisms and reporting going forward on this, but without an external independent uh, group or body that is following this, it's going to be very difficult to, to even strengthen or encourage you know, in, in any of these parts. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you, uh, uh, Luis uh, Villaron. Thank you. Uh, in 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 B, with regard to strength and coordination, I, I think it's still missing uh, the issue of the uh, investment treaties, uh, uh, who also have an, an impact on, you know, uh, how you actually uh, do use uh, a flexibility. So uh, so so maybe I think it will be useful to to. To have express mention on investment, uh, you know, agreements uh, in, you know, to 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 have some also coordination on that topic and and the the, the issue of investment uh, uh, treaties uh, implications uh, also uh, is something that should come up in in the next uh, article. How how would you how would you speak to the investment agreements and could you kind of elaborate to people, you know, what where you're going with this. Well, I mean, the, 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 in in investment treaties are obligations uh, to compensate uh, or, or 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 give the the right to an investor, for example, a, a pharmaceutical company, uh, you know, investment in a, in a given country. Uh, if there is a flexibility used in that country, for example, you use a, a 
a, a compulsory licensing, uh, maybe uh, the investor, you know, might consider that it's, it's not only a IP issue, but an investment problem because they have rely on not having a compulsory licensing uh, provided when they put the money for uh, the, the research. So, so they can go to a, a private arbitration in, in, and then the private arbitration uh, will uh, uh, pr provide for a uh, compensation. So, so that's really a big deterrent uh, for a country to to apply a flexibility of IP because it it might also have an implication uh, uh, or, or responsibility under investment. So, so, so we need to find uh, some way to uh, avoid that the investment treaty uh, are in the way when the decision of, of applying a flexibility uh, of intellectual property uh, or other uh, measure uh, related to public health uh, that affect the interest of the, the owner of the technology. Uh, I don't know if it, that, that was no, no, clear no, no. or- I got it. I, that's pretty clear. And it's really, I think, a, a really good point. Uh, Guilherme from uh, IFBMA. Thank you. So we read this article as trying to enhance interpandemic manufacturing capacity, uh, including for license. Are you, are, uh, you the, talking about, are you talking about all of three or just three B? All of three. Okay. Uh, as, as a whole, that's the objective uh, of three. Uh, and uh, the, the only issue we have is like how you're going to finance that capacity that is built. Uh, so it, and it's worked both for innovator and generic. So if more uh, pro, uh, manufacturers are producing pandemic products in the absence of a pandemic, uh, that costs money, uh, keeping the factories warm. Uh, and we couldn't see a, a mechanism here uh, that would make it commercially viable. And again, that's for both generics and one originators to keep that capacity. Do you think there's a white elephant problem uh, with these facilities? Totally, yeah, yeah. Can you, can you explain to people what that means? Is that you pay a lot of money through either public or private sources to keep uh, uh, a factory on, uh, but there is very little demand. So you end up wasting a lot of resources. And we have seen this in some uh, vaccine uh, challenges in the past. All right, thank you. Uh, Joshua, uh, so Professor Sarnoff. Uh, just to return to Lewis's uh, comment, you might think about linking it to the WTO tobacco um, and make explicit reference to the right to regulate um, as and that regulation for public health isn't expropriation. So that's all. Yeah, actually, if you had a statement that went right to that issue, uh, it'd be difficult to get a consensus, but that would do it. Um, Moga? from uh, uh, People's Vaccine Alliance? So on, on uh, B, I think B is lumping quite a lot of things that don't relate to each other. So in, in kind of in, in this, uh, uh, and take into account, I totally agree with Brother Lancet about uh, strengthening and coordinating and all these vague words. Uh, but there is already a current coordination mechanism between WTO, WTO, WHO, and, and WIPO on IP issues and, and, I guess, trade issues as well. So what, you want more of that? And then you include matching supply and demand. This is totally different. And, and, and then you've got about mapping capacity. That's another function. And in fact, in terms of matching supply and demand, and then actually, part of the problems of the vaccines is that delivering the vaccine to people, it was really many actors, were, including UN, but others, working, not working together and coordinating on the ground. This is like, you know, let's have coordination meetings sitting in Geneva, but on the ground, things are different. So I think it's, it's just lumping lots of things that don't belong to each other and we should really separate them and be clear what do you mean by um, coordination? What do you mean by coordination at, at a global, if you like, level or at organ, big UN level and, and coordination on the ground? But, but by the way, on the, on the issue of the mapping capacity, uh, in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in the spring of 2020, we uh, uh, tried to 
figure out where you could manufacture vaccines. And there wasn't really any database of where manufacturing facilities were. And later, we, we, we shared the information we have, which I think then others did some work on, but then SEPI did a confidential survey yeah. of where manufacturing capacity was, but they wouldn't make anything public in terms of the actual facility. So it's always, I always thought if you had the capacity to do something, you'd be proud of it. You know, I, why would it be a secret? Like I can do something, but I'm not going to tell you I can do it. It seemed like a weird thing to make all this stuff so confidential. I, but we were really happy to see that. Now, the next speaker is Matthias. And they, they updated um, it. Matthias from uh, WHO. Thank you very much, James. I would just like to uh, make a quick comment about C, this uh, encourage entities to grant um, uh, licenses. I think it's important that this is not li limited to pandemic response uh, products, because as uh, Guillermo said, there is a risk that you're going to see these white elephants. And it's important that uh, all possible products are included to, include to keep these this manufacturing sites warm. And uh, as you know, we have this WHO mRNA tech transfer hub, which obviously is beyond the COVID-19 vaccines. And so it shows that we need basically these licenses beyond the COVID-19 vaccines, so beyond pandemic response products. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, um, thank, thank you very much. Um, does anyone else have any comments on this paragraph three on the intra-pandemic times? Things which I think, as people, I think you know, are, are pretty aware. Of. Most of the measures, when uh, it's pre-pandemic, they tend to be uh, a lot of encourage, strengthen, coordinate, collaborate, facilitate, incentivize. They're all kind of, for the most part, uh, uh, so, some things are a little bit more specific. Like you know, you're supposed to be mapping. That, that's a very specific thing that you have to do. Um, Jamie, Jamie, can I just add? I, I forgot my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I, oh, I'm sorry. I thought I, I thought I called you. I, I oh, it's, it's down again. I don't know. <laughs> um, just, just two comments, and one is linked to. And my apologies for my mic was not working. Now it does work. I hope. Um, I just wanted to pick up on three B, where I think I mean yes, indeed, the the, the language as is is very open ended. But um, you know, when when you just started discussing the preambular part, I wanted to sort of make that comment, and I think it, it also relates to this particular uh, subparagraph. We actually have something which is perhaps slightly more concrete in what is the WTO's pandemic declaration of last June, because the very last paragraph talks about uh, exactly this uh, sort of uh, matchmaking, if you want, uh, sort of identifying demands uh, and and so on. Uh, but it calls for a specific uh, sort of response and not uh, just coordination. So in that sense, I think the text overall could benefit at some stage from re some reference to what is actually included in the, the WTO's pandemic re response, because it may in, in certain instances be uh, somewhat clearer than, than the text as is here. That that's um, that's one comment I wanted to make, and then just on on what you were discussing, uh, so sort of about three A, for example, not being concrete enough. Yes and no, because I, I think it, it's uh, quite strong language in terms of the obligations which are imposed on parties, uh, because they are committed to incentivize manufacturers, so so they have to provide incentives. So it's not a just a sort of best endeavor language. I think in that sense, it, it goes a bit further. It's different when it comes to sort of obligations or not uh, on, on manufacturers, but I think for what governments are undertaking, there, there is some concrete stuff in, in that paragraph. Thank you. Uh, Roger, how, how would you compare this to the uh, the obligations in the WTO TRIPS agreement to do technology transfer and capacity building um, in terms of how, how, how strong the language is? Well, I, I think we, we have actually similar language in 66.2, which is an obligation to incentivize your companies to transfer technology to, well, in that case, least developed countries. Um, and, and that I think, I mean, I personally believe has produced uh, concrete results in terms of 
uh, the many projects which have been put in place by developed countries. So it's not like a completely toothless uh, sort of instrument, certainly for what is uh, 66.2 in the TRIPS agreement. Uh, prof uh, Professor Baker, followed by Michelle Childs from DNDI, but first Brooke. Well, just to say, I mean, and this will go back to two, you could, you could instead of saying promote and incentivize, you could say require. You could, countries can require things. You know, they, they don't just have to incentivize. They can require companies to do things. That's one of the regulatory mechanisms they have and use quite frequently in lots of areas. So, I mean, yes, there's something in, you know, in, in the idea of promoting and incentivizing, but it doesn't guarantee a result. If you want to get a guarantee a result, then you require someone to do something. <clears throat> Michelle Childs, DNDI. Thanks, Jamie. If this is just a, a, a general point, perhaps an obvious one is um, also, I mean, it's helpful to go through um, article by article, but it's also, I think, important to look at how the different sections are or, are or could hang together. Because for example, you know, when you're talking about some of the, the mapping work and what needs to be done into pandemic, if you look at article six, it sets up uh, you know, the WHO global pandemic supply chain and logistics network. And part of that is pre-pandemic to anticipate and map you know, what the key elements would be needed for the development of already identified um, pandemic um, products. So I, I accept what Melissa is saying, but I think there's some interplay between the two. And, and also, if you look at um, 3C, when it talks about um, the manufacturers and, you know, mutually agreed terms, and uh, particularly those who um, have received public financing, I think that also needs to be linked to, you know, Article 9, where it's talking about how you would uh, establish appropriate conditions for publicly financed research and development, which include uh, manufacturing. So I think we also need to look at the way that they've written this in terms of how that follows through. And that also applies to financing. I mean, the point that the, the person from the IFPMA made about how you will keep um, the, the infrastructure warm in, in an interpandemic uh, period. I think it's an important point, both in terms of the products that you use, but also financing. If you look at the financing section in Article 19, it has a kind of uh, a placeholder for um, financing of um, relevant capacities. So I think you know one of the things also is how these elements fit together and in what place do you put the specificity of, of, of say financing or licensing because at the moment it's, it's referenced in some places and then more specific in others, over. I think that's a uh, was a great uh, comment and observation by Michelle Childs. I'd like to, uh, Berkeley has his hand up and after Burke speaks, I'd like to ask Miriam Saban to uh, uh, reflect on what uh, Michelle just said, but go ahead, Burke, Professor Baker. Uh, just one quick thing. Uh, there's the reference to significant public financing and that occurs elsewhere in the text. And what's significant? I mean, um, quite unclear uh, in, in terms of what percentage what stage of risk uh, the investment occurs, um, and you know, without greater precision about that, countries would have great flexibility in deciding. Well, if we give ninety percent, then we can impose in conditions, but if we only give twenty percent, even though it's uh, you know initial stage, you know breakthrough research, uh, we don't have anything to, you know, we can't impose any conditions. So it's not just here, but it's continued throughout with this idea of what's significant um, public investment. Uh, Miriam, uh, do, do you have any reflections on what Michelle just said? Uh, sure, thanks. Uh, it just, um, I, you know, I really, I agree. Uh, and, um, you know, if you look at the, the, the overall document, um, it, it reads, unfortunately, still in, in a bit of a, an old-fashioned pre, uh, pre-pandemic uh, way. Um, and, you know, we use the term siloed a lot, but it still is very much, you know, um, trying to get particular pieces of, of uh, you know, what, what's important it, um, it, ov overall in, but it doesn't hold together. Uh, the other, and part of that is that there isn't, um, you know, an, an overall 
connection between, for, for example, uh, universal health coverage is separated from equity, uh, ethnic, issues with ethnic groups is separated from race. So, you know, all these things that we've learned or we've tried to really promote in the course of the pandemic um, in, in the last several years is not reflected uh, in this in this document uh, sufficiently um, in, in more of a syndemic uh, and socio-determinant sense. So I do think more work is, is required on how the entire document holds together, because right now it's not really reflecting the opportunity that we have uh, at, at this point three years in. All right, uh, th thanks. I'd like to uh, move us forward a bit to paragraph four of Article 7. And this one I, I expect would be, you know, th these are some, um, uh, 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 the intellectual property provisions. And I'd like to start with the first, uh, like 4A, and that is that, that uh, it's a, uh, <clears throat> yeah, parties will take appropriate measures to support time bound waivers of intellectual property rights. They can accelerate or scale up manufacturing during a pandemic to the extent necessary. Uh, uh, Alan Tone. Okay, um, I think Gopa had his hand up before me, but I'll, I'll be I'll be quick. Um, no, go ahead. Uh, it's it's struck it struck me, uh, just a, a couple of of of, of quick comments. Uh, the the previous paragraph talks about shell, and here that word shell is not used, and that is that 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 is I think significant. That's something to um, to to consider. Second, here you see a lot of um sort of hardcore measures in the field of intellectual property but only when the pandemic hits and um i think the speaker from the who made a similar comment earlier in the meeting that you also may need these kinds of uh, these kinds of measures um to be strengthened they they exist of course these are rights that countries have but there should also be commitments to use them in order to ensure that um, uh, products are developed, that the technology is, is, is transferred timely, particularly with a view to the need of main building and maintaining manufacturing capacity in the periods between pandemics. And this, this text divorces these, the, the pandemic and the non-pandemic period very, uh, very strictly over. Uh, thank you, Gopa from TWN. So just um, uh, three comments. The first one, I think, um, uh, you know, when we discuss uh, the para seven, I think it's a <clears throat> good idea to look at uh, what the Africa uh, used in, you know, Article 13A of uh, uh, the IHR. I think uh, those proposals, I, uh, you know, uh, I urge everybody to read those uh, proposals. I think uh, they are much more concrete than what is there in the uh, uh, zero draft here. Um, you know, uh, just to uh, give a flavor, uh, it basically obligates WHO to uh, carry out an assessment and to come out with an allocation mechanism, obligates countries to go ahead, uh, you know, comply with the uh, complaints mechanism. It's also talk about, you know, use the flexibilities uh, and it creates an obligation to use the flexibilities. And also uh, it talks about sharing of uh, cell lines, and it also talks about uh, the, uh, as Michelle earlier mentioned, you know, publicly funded, uh, uh, tech, uh, you know, technologies to be. There is an obligation uh, uh, to share these technologies, <clears throat> and it sets a further and set of obligations on WHO uh, to uh, even to establish uh, to establish a platform where in which they can put the product profiles, product specifications, so then there is a scope for an open manufacturing. These are some of the experience, you know, countries gained during um, uh, COVID. So it, it, compared to those texts, what is there in Article 7 is very, very minimal. And uh, though it's mentioned on, you know, 7.4, uh, that's my second comment. If you look at the 7.4, uh, A, uh, A to D, I think uh, they are only, uh, you know, very best endeavor clauses. 
even though it uh, you know as uh, ellen already pointed out a and b uses the will instead of shall and then c and d uses shall but the next word is uh, you know look at shall encourage shall encourage so it qualitatively it does not make any difference uh, right uh, so you can keep on encouraging but nobody get encouraged that's what uh, you know normally we have seen uh, from the especially the big uh, even 100 years of monopoly they are not ready to uh, do so so uh, we will end up with that problem and thirdly i think uh, it's important we need to uh, also uh, when you talk about uh, uh, pandemic uh, our understanding is that it is much more a serious problem than the normal public health emergencies of uh, international concern so therefore uh, the text should provide a clear map how are they going to achieve the uh, uh, address the equity issues so there is no clear plan in the text so therefore this text itself you know is too premature uh, to start a negotiation um, so actually the if you look at the modalities they want to have a negotiation on 27th you cannot have a negotiation on this text because it is reinforcing um, the status quo and uh, i think um, you know we should urge member states to provide a written uh, textual proposal on this because it does not change anything it's just you know uh, very uh, high words uh, you know these are the goals to be achieved but there is no direction how to achieve these goals right so i think uh, keeping in that thing and to read the uh, proposals uh, mentioned in the uh, ihr text which gives much more concrete way forward uh, so I, I strongly urge everybody to read the proposals uh, from Africa Group and Bangladesh on 13A, the, the new paragraph proposed. Uh, that gives much more of a way forward and it, it changes the status quo. Thank okay. you. Uh, 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 so that's really important for people, uh, as Gopa mentions, to pay attention to what's going on in the IHR negotiations. I, 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 I start out by saying let's refer to paragraph and number four A, but I think we'll do all four in the comments. So you can you can talk about four A, B, C, or D, you know, the whole section four. And the next uh, person with their hand up is uh, Glare May from IFP May. Thank you, Jamie. I don't think it comes as a surprise to anyone that we think uh, uh, those paragraphs as a whole weaken the intellectual protection affordable to manufacturers. And this has like a implication in our capacity to innovate and ultimately reach access to patients. And uh, particularly for A, uh, by forcing waivers, uh, they may be completely unnecessary. Uh, we have like a very mixed views on the current uh, WTO discussions. And especially if you're taking a one size fits all that in any pandemic, you will take a uh, time bound waivers uh this is uh may not reflect reality of the specific uh manufacturing situation the distribution of uh, manufacturers or the ip landscape uh, uh thank you um uh, wanhu from uh, msf uh thank you jamie so um first i agree with uh, comments from alan and uh, gopa earlier in terms of for um and and the, the the need for strengthening the the language shell and also we also concern uh c, c and d and the four shell encourage is too vague um on, overall on on seven there's also another issue just to add to what ellen and gop has said is that in terms of a uh, trips flexibility um so the the you know now it being framed as um under for um, in the event of pandemic and the parties will take appropriate measures uh, and you know will apply the full use but the experiences we see is that if you only do that during the pandemic it's late so we thought the overall um, seven in terms of ip and flexibility probably would benefit from reframing as strengthening national regional capacity about using the flexibility, um, including legislative measures, administrative measures, starting with reviewing the laws and make sure you actually have a flexibility in law and know how to use it as an essential measure to prepare. 
because uh, we can't just wait flexibility issue only kick in when pandemic occur. It has to be reframed a little bit, reflecting the, the longer term strategy in the interpandemic era. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker I have is uh, Luis Filron from Chile. Well, thank you, James. Yeah, just to, to follow on on what the previous speaker was saying is that uh, we 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 miss a, a provision that will uh, mandate to adopt, uh, uh, of, you know, according to, to national law, uh, the, the the provisions in in the in the within the national law because uh, a big issue is that uh, they are not uh, available. Uh, so so. I think that a, a, a good wording uh, could, could be taken for in, in Article 10. Uh, there, there, there is a, a reference to, to uh, that, that the, the countries uh, shall uh, uh, adopt legislation for uh, uh, is Article 10 uh, uh, J uh, says. Open adoption, each party shall in accordance with national law adopt and implement effective legislative, executive, administrative, or other measure to give effect. Uh, in, and then we, we could apply that uh, for uh, the, the three flexibilities. Yeah. But I, also, I, yes. Uh, Louis, Louis, I, I just, uh, on this point, the Marrakesh Treaty at WIPO for uh, people who are blind or have other re reading disabilities does what you say, right? It mandates that you have certain exceptions. And it also, like 4B, it, it actually mandates that you actually use the exceptions and it mandates that you use them internationally. So what you're suggesting is what's missing in this is the part, as I understand your comment, the part where you have to have the adequate exception in the first place, is that correct? Yes, I mean, uh, the, the, the point is that it, it, the country should adopt and implement legislation uh, uh, legislative reforms uh, to uh, give effect uh, flexibilities because the the problem is that they do have the the, the theoretical <clears throat> right of the flexibility but because it's not in the law then they cannot do it I, yeah so, I, 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 so that's I, I, why I, 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 if i if i could just uh, like the language in b for b talks about the full use of flexibility. And to me, that's kind of a, an open-ended thing. It's almost meaningless because it's so open-ended because nobody uses the full flexibility of the TRIPS agreement. You, you, you know, that would be cool if they did, but nobody does. And so I think what you're saying is that you have to have an exception to achieve the objectives in the agreement, right? You have, like with the Treaty for the Blind, the exceptions you had to have were related to the outcome you wanted. You wanted to have blind people have access to accessible works. In this case, you have to have the exceptions related to things you're trying to do related to pandemics, correct? Yeah, I mean, it, it has to be, a, that's why I'm pointing out a, a, an alternative wording that is already in the text for the recognition of the PAP system uh, in, in J, they have like a, 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 a very assertive way to say that the countries should have the laws in place. So, so, right. so, that, so that's, uh, that's my point. And, and also, uh, yes. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish your point. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. And 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 the second point is in that the 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 reference to this specific article 27, 30, and 31, and 31b it, it should should be uh, complemented with uh, or, or other like article 44 uh, uh, of trips related to to limitation of remedies. Uh, which also we know has a, a lot of implication, and I stop here. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 Anthony, uh, Anthony Ta uh, Talbin from uh, WTO. Uh, hi, uh, hi, good, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, this is this is going to be a a, a, a critical area of, of uh, debate and development of the text. And I just wanted to make uh, not 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 a point of advocacy, but more a, a, a technical observation that uh, the relationship between uh, paragraphs A and B here is 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 important. Also, maybe the idea to uh, unpack uh, the concept of waiver of intellectual property 
right uh because I, I, we know we know from from our experience with the you know the very difficult uh, ongoing trips debate that the apart from the the substantive issues there's there's a lot of confusion about the different categories of of intervention if you like i don't think anyone's uh, i think i think it's, it's very clear that um governments uh, can have and should have uh, very significant agency in in uh, 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 curbing the exclusive effects of, of IP rights when when uh, the public interest determines that, and that's, that's the broad principle. Uh, but the question, not only in the text, but also in the way this might be implemented, which ultimately is, is when it counts, uh, some degree of, of clarification might be helpful. Uh, so, you know, the idea of a waiver of intellectual property rights, it's, um, I, 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 quite honestly, I'm not clear whether that's a choice by right holders. It can be, that's a form of waiver. Whether it's um, a, a use of existing flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement, which, uh, you know, we know there's a, there's a spectrum of these from traditional compulsory licensing to government use orders, crown use orders and, and the like. Uh, or, or something beyond that, uh, and you know, th these are these are just from a purely practical point of view. Th these are quite quite distinct in character. I only mention this because it, it has been the source of genuine, kind of understandable confusion, um, and uh, uh, we, we don't want a, a text, whatever emerges, that that uh, doesn't give that kind of practical agency to 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 member states in this in this case um this is not to make any any particular point about the the, the, the text or even in the direction it goes into but just to, to just to point out that uh it may be helpful uh either in the background conversations or or more broadly to to unpack the these ideas so we've got a we've got a better idea of what what um uh what's the spectrum of of interventions look like uh, again, th this is building on our experience with the the very difficult, you know, ongoing conversations uh, in the WTO leading up to MC12 and beyond, where, for example, as a very simple example, a conflation between a waiver of international obligations under TRIPS, on the one hand, and um, a limitation on the exclusive uh, effect of IP rights in the domestic domain, on the other hand. These tended to be uh, conflated, and of course, um, just from a purely practical point of view, they're not the same thing. Uh, so it, it'd be unfortunate to see a text go forward that that didn't take the opportunity to to at least clarify clarify these points and uh, provide something of a roadmap for for, for you know, positive steps forward. Anyway, that, but as I say, I'm I'm not. Uh, you know, obviously, there's a huge debate. I'm not. I'm not entering in either side. But just from a from a technical point of view, they, these are some ideas that it'd be very good to have this uh, this uh, wide discussion about. And and others have mentioned, I think, um, Louis just now on you know the the relationship also with um, the limitations on remedies, which is a mechanism that uh, is already used in in some jurisdictions. Thanks, yeah, uh, Anthony. We, 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 so. Just to, on your point, uh, the original WTO debate was on a waiver of WTO rules, but here in the text here, it's about a waiver on intellectual property rights. And I think that's, I think, partly because the debate on what the WTO was asked to do was often presented in the press as a waiver of intellectual property rights as opposed to a waiver of WTO rules on intellectual property. Do you, do you agree with that? No, absolutely, and and you know, it, 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 honestly, it doesn't matter, you know, what your position in this whole huge debate is. Uh, nobody benefits from that that uh, that conflation or that confusion because, uh, and 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 just as a from that's why I mentioned it from a practical point of view. Uh, we know from 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 numerous discussions with um, with uh, uh, officials with 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 advisors that it it, it can create the the impression that. An international instrument serves the purpose of domestic action, and of course it can't. I mean, that's that's not controversial. That's uh, that, that, that's something you, you, Jamie, you've been working on for many years. But so um, all I'm saying is, is from a point of view of clarity and and uh, um, 
ultimate practical implementation, uh, it, it would be helpful to have that have that have that uh, that that clarification because it has been it has been a, a really unfortunate point of confusion right through the whole pandemic debate. I mean, there's many other issues, but that's just one of them. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Professor Baker. Yeah, just to completely agree with with that comment, and and one thing to think about possible amendments is to make clear that we'll take appropriate measures to support time limited uh, WTO, FTA, investment treaty, and national law waivers of intellectual property. In other words, to cover the gamut of places where there needs to be formal suspension of IP rules, um, and and you know which which is really necessary to, to make this, you know, have, have practical meaning. I, I would notice that uh, to the extent necessary is a limitation that could come back and bite uh, us a little bit. Uh, who, who's going to determine, uh, you know, whether a waiver is necessary, you know, what, what the extent necessary is for a waiver obligation to be triggered. And then going to B, um, I, I agreed with the comment that we need to, to to discuss the obligation of countries to act on their own behalf to adopt and use TRIPS flexibilities and to adopt and use the provisions of this treaty itself. Um, going back to, to A just a little bit, and, and maybe this is a question to Anthony. I mean, one of the one of the complexities of thinking about you know um, this treaty in the WHO context is what what would be its relationship to obligations under the uh, WTO that are independent of WHO? And, and the idea of if you commit in a WHO treaty to adopt a waiver at the WTO, is that, is that an enforceable obligation? Is that kind of limit future debate at the WTO in terms of actually uh, you know, that, that adoption occurring? Um, because if we, be nice to to get something that would agree to to, to change international uh, and and free trade agreement provisions that that will haunt countries if they, if they wanted to try to use the WHO treaty. Uh, if I could if I could just give one comment before I go to Ellen next, uh, uh, we filed for a compulsory license in the Dominican Republic, Luis. Um, Abinader, who's on this call, was the lawyer in the case. He's from the Dominican Republic. And uh, there, there was a, a trade agreement between the United States government and the Dominican Republic that said that they had to honor data exclusivity for six years. And this was on Paxivita Therapeutic. And there were generics available in one license to have a Dominican Republic manufacturer. And that Dominican Republic manufacturer under the trade agreement could sell outside the Dominican Republic, but not in its own country because of this provision, the trade agreement. We asked USTR to provide us a letter saying that if the compulsory license was granted, they would waive the obligation in the FDA for six years of test data exclusivity during the pandemic. And they declined to do so. Uh, next, uh, I, I'm just gonna go to Alan Tahone uh, from Medicines Law and Policy. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jamie. Uh, on that point, this is now recognized or increasingly recognized in the European Union and the draft new or the draft uh, pharmaceutical legislation um, foresees in a in a data exclusivity waiver in the case of compulsory licensing. I have to see how well, whether it will survive or not. But I, I was pleased to to see that. It's not the point I wanted to make. The the point I wanted to make is more about how these these very undoubtedly very thorny discussions around intellectual property and access to, to know how technology transfer would be helped, I think, if there was also a very <coughs> clear commitment for the financing of necessary in innovations. There's, um, there's a reference to, for example, uh, which, which I think is, 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 is a good point requiring um, those that have uh, received significant public financing to waive or manage as appropriate, slightly problematic language, their royalties on the continued use of their technology. But there isn't a clear commitment that there is going to be significant public financing. And that is something I think in terms of the coherence, coherence of this international agreement, an, an important uh, point to pay attention to. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ellen. Uh, Natin from TWN. Uh, 
thank you. I was just uh, looking through the, uh, the the four different uh, five different paragraphs of Article Seven, and there's kind of you know uh, same question. You know, it's it's uh, it's it is not tr trying to generate legal obligations. So it, it really questions then why are we having an Article Nineteen instrument for right? Uh, we committed to have a legal obligation, specific legal obligation to do some of these things. And if it is, uh, I, I also understand you know there is kind of two different words being used, like, for example, as appropriate in paragraph four and mutually agreed terms in paragraph three, which kind of, you know, end up transactionalizing kind of exchange or transfer of technology uh, whenever it is needed. And we, we kind of end up in a kind of a situation where thinking of whether this will happen at any point of time. Right. So so why don't we try to perhaps uh, use some of the other other ways in why which we get things credibly done, for example, uh, why don't we say that uh, if there is a standard transfer agreement, tech transfer agreement uh, developed by the health assembly or you know WHO, and only to those uh, those manufacturers who agree to that agreement, we give we give access to pathogens, or we give access to information, or we take up uh, we we ask researchers and entities to take up that kind of a condition that they they transfer their research outcomes to manufacturers who would agree to the standard. Uh, transfer agreement developed in WHO. I mean, I understand it's a, a bit radical, a kind of forceful thought, but on the other hand, uh, something has to be done uh, in order to make things work. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm going to next go to uh, Roger from WTO, followed by uh, Juan Hu from, from MSF. But before that, I just wanted to go back to this issue of, on B, the the uh, the flexibilities mentions, which are Article twenty seven thirty and thirty one thirty one bis, uh, during the uh, are, are limited. People have mentioned in the chat that uh, Article six of the trips on exhaustion of rights, uh, mm -hmm. Article uh, what seventy three or seventy four. I forget what one the book put in. Article thirty nine on te on test data. Uh, uh, Louise mentioned uh, Article 44 of the TRIPS. Uh, Article 44 of the TRIPS was the most used flexibility in the pandemic. The U.S. Got, we have a report, the U.S. government, uh, we looked at 62 contracts that the U.S. government issued uh, for, for drugs, vaccines, uh, diagnostics, uh, uh, protective equipment, things like that, with, uh, with big name companies, small name companies, and, and 59 of the 62 had a, uh, uh, a provision in and that allowed the company performing the contract to use any patent granted now or in the future by the US government without the permission of the patent owner. And they didn't even have an obligation to notify uh, the patent owners or to identify the patents that they were using. And uh, there's some litigation right now where these things are being sort of sorted out in court uh, involving Moderna and Pfizer and other companies. but. Uh, Article 44 on the limitation of remedies, which applies to all intellectual property rights in the WTO uh, TRIPS agreement, not just patents, is was where all the action was. And, and, and I would encourage the negotiators to, to look at what the U.S. did during the pandemic with the TRIPS flexibility on uh, the withholding of injunctions. Um, and then the other uh, things that people have mentioned. So, so I think the, the, the list that's out there now is, is too narrow. Uh, and the other thing is that there was early in the pandemic, people worried about designs, copyrights, things, things that were being asserted against generic ventilators or things like that could be done with 3D printing. And going forward, uh, we may have a different intellectual property rights outside of the WTO agreement in the areas of data, artificial intelligence and things like that, that uh, you'll have to kind of take into effect. So. So it, it shouldn't say including, it, it should perhaps say something like including, but not limited to, or something like that, you know, in terms of the WTO provisions, because there'll be intellectual property rights, as people mentioned in, uh, outside the WTO, uh, that would be in some cases more important than what you see inside the, the WTO. Now I'm gonna go to D uh, Roger uh, uh, from the WTO. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. And, and this wasn't the purpose for raising the hand, but. Uh, I think any attempt to have a complete list of flexibilities would probably be designed to fail because uh, there's so much in, in the TRIPS agreement. So something which is more open-ended, I think, is, is probably 
the most appropriate in this context. What I wanted to say is, uh, well, I want to come back to the question which was raised by Brooke, I, I think. So what about the link with existing uh, WTO obligations? And I, I, I think the, the answer to this very much depends on the point Tony was making. What in the first place do we understand by the term waiver? Because uh, in certain you know, ways of reading this term, there may not be a, a conflict uh, with WTO obligations if, if you bring it down to you know, government use uh, of uh, exceptions to, to override existing patent rights. Well, that's in line with the, the, the TRIPS agreement. That's one thing. And the other comment is, um, of course, we, uh, as, as you know, one of the previous uh, speakers said, the, um, we have to see this in a holistic manner. And, and we, we have a provision in Article 2 uh, which deals with uh, no relationship with existing international agreements, but in a way which I think is 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 again not necessarily uh, offering the the clarity as as would be necessary because it seems to say in one place uh, soft shall not uh, conflict with existing international obligations, but then also in in another another place uh, it talks about if there there is sort of overlap with existing areas of work of international organizations um, in that case appropriate uh, sort of solution should should be found so what does this mean uh, so it leaves us a bit in, in a sort of unclear sphere i think if indeed we, we end up by concluding that there is a, a sort of um, conflict zone but but again i think there's a big if in terms of uh, link to what is the meaning of the term waiver as such thank you Thank, thank you. I, I've got uh, one of them from MSF and if you are from Oxfam, People's Vaccine Alliance. But after they speak, I would uh, like us to go on to a different topic, which would be the transparency provisions in the agreement, followed after that by discussion of the benefit sharing provisions. Uh, Juan? Juan who? Yeah, uh, very, very quick ones to supplement what I said before. And also um, in terms of uh, four um, four point B, I think it's, uh, I sort of agree with um, uh, open ending option to keep it open and also for potentially uh, options that are not specifically listed in, in TRIPS agreement, but the national law allow it uh, that is not prohibited by international law. So I think keep uh, open ending would be beneficial in some way. But on, uh, I mean, a quick one is on uh, CMD. Well, we said it, the language is weak, but there potentially a need to also consolidate uh, a more coherent strategy linking with um, public funding conditions and the nine, because if, um, you know, public funding uh, term and conditions would be uh, essential preparedness measure also under NI with some strengthening and it could reinforcing uh, the purposes under seven. So when pandemic occur, you don't just encourage and have something in hand already. So I think the overall strategic connection could be strengthened in that sense between seven and nine. Thanks. Uh, th th thank you, Pierre, Pierre uh, from from People's Vaccine Alliance. Or did you you put your hand down? Do you, do you still want to uh, comment? Yes, a quick comment uh, also on seven point four B. So on the use of flex flexibilities, we think that it would be useful to add explicit commitment there also for countries not to obstruct or dissuade other countries from using flexibilities. It can refer explicitly or not necessarily to bilateral and bilateral agreements to ensure that they are not the barrier. It is somehow evident because uh, in the introductory chapter, Article 2.2, it is already mentioned that countries should not enter into agreements that are not compatible with these obligations under these accords. But we think that explicit commitments in 7.4b would also be useful. Thank you. Uh, Th th thank you very much. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we are now, uh, uh, we got about uh, uh, 40 minutes left and uh, we haven't gone very far through the, the text. I think Ellen Charles, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Michelle Charles earlier, uh, Ellen Charles, mixing two, two, two people up here. Uh, Michelle Charles from DNDI, she, she reminded us of, of how important uh, different articles uh, it, 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 are there related to these topics people are interested in that we haven't even got to yet? And 
I'm going to apologize if we just can't get through everything. I'd like to switch right now to Article 9 on increasing research and development capacities, and specifically to refer to uh, 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 paragraph 3, 7, and 10 relating to transparency issues. And uh, in Article 9, paragraph 3, it says, parties shall increase transparency of information about funding of research and development for pandemic products. And then they give these A, B, C uh, 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 obligations that are in there. Uh, I don't know if people have spent much time uh, thinking about the transparency provisions, but from our point of view, the lack of transparency during the pandemic was a really unfortunate thing coming one year after the WHO adopted a resolution on transparency that was a big high profile negotiation at the WTO in WHA 72.8. And in the run up to the zero draft and the comments we submitted, we are always encouraging the delegates to have a separate chapter on transparency, because transparency goes to all sorts of different things uh, in the pandemic response. That didn't happen, but there were a lot of provisions about transparency. And if we could start with Article uh, 9, number 3, uh, it, 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 do, do people have any thoughts or, uh, on, on, on these obligations? And I, I have Brooke has his hand up. I'll start with Brooke. Jamie, with your indulgence, I want to just say something about Article 8 regulatory That's issues fine. first, uh, yeah. because I think it's critically important. Um, I think we saw that, you know, as many delays that were occurred because of IP status, there are also delays in the pandemic because of regulatory issues. Um, and this, I think this overall, this, uh, this, uh, this text is very weak in discussing regulatory barriers. For example, it places no obligations on uh, uh, manufacturers or right holders to register broadly or register everywhere. Uh, and we know that as a practical matter, in the absence of registration, products can't be marketed except through special exceptions or emergency provisions, which simply is, is oftentimes either not available or, or not, doesn't make sense. And some of us have begun to really advocate for the idea that there should be a human rights duty to register products broadly. Uh, to ensure access in small and poor countries, as well as rich countries always coming first. The second issue with respect to regulatory issues is that the performance of WHO certainly needs to be strengthened to the extent that, and we know that there's criticisms of the excessive reliance on WHO pre-qualification, but it's there. And it's quite slow and undercapacitated at this point in time and contributed significantly to the delay and access to uh, antigen rapid diagnostic tests and self tests. Um, related to that, though, not you know, just since I'm talking about the WHO, there's absolutely no mention throughout the entire text on the importance of issuance of, of guidance on use cases uh, and and therapeutic use. Uh, again, an area where WHO was uh, regrettably very slow, uh, and you know where rich countries got you know access to products months before. Uh, and, and you know, in use case authorization months before WHO uh, issued any any uh, even living guidance, let alone uh, final guidance. So uh, I, I maybe we'll have another discussion at another time on those issues. But I do think that um, and and Gopa and others have have certainly spent a lot of time uh, thinking about the regulatory issues in terms of speeding it up for biologics and for vaccines, and there, there are a bunch of other more technical issues that need to be addressed. Um, th th thank you, Brooke. And, and I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not going to be too too heavy handed, but I like people to respond uh, to focus a bit on the transparency things. But it's fine if if people want to add things that that, that, that w w you know we haven't addressed yet. But there's a hand up from is it Janice? Uh, is that am I pronouncing your name right, Janice? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, it, it, it's me. It, no, I just wanted to emphasize the aspect of the re regulatory uh, issue. I, I, I'm sorry, could you just tell people a bit about like who, who you work for? 
Hey, I'm Yanis Lasdins. I used to be with WHO TDR in product research and development in the early days. And now I'm retired and I'm just following this uh, and advising several groups. Uh, obviously, the regulatory part, I agree fully, it's, it's extremely weak. Uh, because, for example, it doesn't link with Article 10, which is the research and the clinical development. Uh, it also doesn't link at all with the post-regulatory activities that should be enhanced by regulatory uh, authorities, like the whole pharmacovigilance, the detection of uh, things that may go wrong, et cetera, et cetera. I think that has to be done. And also on the technical level, on Article 10, uh, there are quite a few things that technically sounds extremely superficial, like said by somebody who really doesn't clearly know the, the dimensions and the implications. But I would like you to proceed with what you had planned, but maybe we could address the technical aspects of the paragraphs in the research group. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And, and also, I, 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 I think that like two hours, you know, in a really complicated text is, is not going to do justice uh, to really lots of important issues. And I will do what we can. And, and I'm sure that there'll be follow up conversations. And I think that what you're highlighting and what Brooke highlighted on, on regulatory things are really hugely important. Um, I have a one who and then um, from MSF followed by GOPA followed by Rachel Crockett from DADI. One who? Yeah. Sorry for taking a lot of floor. Uh, quickly on transparency, I mean, um, quick quick uh, reaction to that. Um, from our current reading, the overall issue of transparency need to be looked at altogether. Um, as Jamie said, a couple, a couple of provisions mention transparency, but it's not totally coherent from the current reading, starting from the guiding principle of transparency, guiding principle six mentioned the transparency, but it's very strangely constructed by focusing something only about sharing of the pathogen is missing the whole picture of what being discussed in the transparency resolution, the whole spectrum of information that need to be there as a guiding principle and then translate it into substantive provisions. And there is also article and the six, uh, point three, um, 3B, I think six, 3B, mentioning the supply chain transparency, but only focus on cost and pricing, missing the other important information about procurement contracts um, to, uh, to help procurement decisions and making sure supply is actually predictable, reliable, and the supply predictions and manufacturing capacity, all of the information needs to be transparent based on our experience with pandemic. And then moving to 9.3, uh, Jimmy mentioned, you know, moving to nine, I think there's a lot of good question there <clears throat> on, on transparency, but we have a um, maybe small question on some of the qualifying language in terms of to the extent of the public funding received. I mean, it's probably understandable, but it's, it's potentially would, um, you know, because there are other, there is a no other uh, provision say, uh, state actually need the standalone transparency policy and law. So it me means that, yeah, to the extent of public uh, funding received um, may kind of restrict the leverage points you can actually ask for disclosure. But at the same time, if you have overarching transparent policy and law, even you know, to beyond the extent of public funding received, there's a still obligation to disclosure. And under NI, there's also, um, uh, I think that this is a, there, there's also a, a paragraph in terms of um, making effort not to include uh, confidentiality agreements and uh, confidentiality um, clauses in agreement, we think that should be reconsidered. This could potentially um, go in contrary what with the objective that's intended to be achieved. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to come back just briefly. Uh, do, you, do you agree one that, that a separate chapter on transparency might be easier to kind of people get people heads around what's included and not included in terms of the transparency obligations. Yeah, that would be great. Good. Uh, Gopa, GWN. Yeah, um, uh, two points. The first one is uh, again on the uh, on the 
regulatory strengthening i think uh, you know in the name of its uh, you know this uh, provision basically uh, pushing a harmonization agenda and the you know regulatory uh, erecting a new kind of regulatory barrier using the treaty so i think uh, that's a problematic thing and uh, mutually agreed terms it say that mutually recognition agreements then sometimes uh, there may not be any sharing of information right if it is registered in uh, x regulatory authority will be considered as registered uh, in y authority so there should be uh, you know regulatory dossiers needs to be exchanged otherwise how do they know so then this will be like a you know a global protection mechanism for a trade secrecy uh, that will uh, you know emerge out of that provision though the paragraph 2 talks about you know you have to share information including uh, regulatory dossiers with other institutions uh, but uh, you know this kind of a mutually uh, cancelling uh, provision i think we need more clarity on that and it comes to article 9 the transparency issue i think why don't uh, the groups should look at it you know something like a uh, R&D observatory, which is, of course, WHO has an R&D observatory, but uh, here uh, uh, that is uh, something which is working outside the legal system. And here, if it's a pandemic and if there is a pandemic related uh, R&D, the best way to maintain thing is to create an obligation and uh, WHO run that observatory instead of, uh, uh, you know, just say every country should uh, maintain uh, transparency in that. I think there should be some obligation on all these areas on WHO. There is nothing in this. Thank you, Gopa. Uh, 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 Rachel Crockett from DNDI. Hi, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll come to the floor later if we manage to get onto the terms and conditions aspects a bit more specifically. You know, I, 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 I think, Rachel, why don't you direct us to where in the document you want us to look at the terms and conditions? Because I, I apologize for not having uh, uh organize this very well so where, where, no, uh, no, what, no, what, what, are, what article would you like us to be looking at right now no, I don't. that was not the point of this intervention but i think um so uh, but just in general in terms of the um the the terms and conditions aspects i'm just looking at the document now to try and find the um the exact number but it's in the r d article nine um there are two aspects to it that both uh say are around endeavouring to include terms and bilateral agreements themselves but then also there's another point about establishing appropriate conditions so there's two aspects in the r d provisions and we, we can come back to that later i think so well no I, I i think i think um <laughs> sure i think i okay. think you're, okay. you're, you're, okay. You're, okay. I, i'd just... like you to talk talk about the, mm -hmm. the the article 9 terms and conditions and and sort of what in particular sure. You don't have to describe everything that's there, but what in particular do you think is the most important for people to be understanding and thinking about? Yeah, okay, cool. So, um, sure, there's a two points in there. So, so like I said, there is the uh, establishing appropriate conditions themselves, but then also a point about endeavoring to include those conditions within bilateral agreements. And I think from, from a member state perspective, it's important to acknowledge that as we all know, obviously the political negotiations on how R&D can meet public interest is not a new conversation and that various resolutions have already agreed very high level principles, you know, the affordability, effectiveness, efficiency, etc. But there is there's clearly a need to go kind of beyond that to more practical, I suppose, implementation of principles um, to, to make sure that there's appropriate safeguards um, and that conditions uh, could be part of the, the, the toolkit, I suppose, for, for equity within R&D. Um, so I think that's to say there of course many elements of R&D end to end that needs to be included in the accord, but there are some that could be specifically helpfully attached to conditions um, on financing and bilateral financing agreements. Um, so I think one if thing. You, if, forward, if, 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 Rachel, if you if you if you could could like write like one or two provisions in the agreement, you know that you wanted in there, what would they be in the terms and conditions? Well, so this, this was kind of my first point, right? I think I think in terms of how the how how this is structured and how the document is structured at the minute, there are lots of elements that are actually talking about conditionalities within funding agreements, which include the transparency conditions, right? They're very specific and they're different and and seem to be separate to the to the to the to the sentence on attaching and developing conditionalities. So there is nothing specific as specific as the transparency aspects on, for example, 
open approaches to um, open approaches of, of kind of data research inputs processes outputs anything to do with licensing approaches the reason I was making this intervention anything to do with registration obligations for example they can all be attached to financing um, uh, financing conditions and there's nothing in there that's that's specific about that as yet so I think that's that was my main point was that the conditionalities aspects are actually quite small at the minute compared to what they probably need to be built out to be to encourage a completely end-to-end R&D um, uh, approach to, to conditionality. So I'll stop there just in case anyone else wants to come in. Uh, uh, thank, thank, thank you. Uh, uh, Pascal Belay, you also have your hand also from DNDI. Yes, thanks Jenny. Just wanted to make one, one uh, particular follow-up point to follow up on, on Rachel's intervention. I, I think what's missing here is the, uh, <laughs> it would be nice if all countries would retrain, would retain rights just as the US does for any R&D they fund. And I'm not sure how, how this could be phrased and whether this could be an obligation, but I think I just, you mentioned this uh, a bit earlier. I think it's, it's really important that, that all countries keep rights, ownership rights, or, or you know, step in rights, uh, put themselves in a position to intervene when they have funded R&D. And I think this is, this is missing from the text, and this could be more specific. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Pascal, uh, uh, in Japan, uh, uh, Sakeko Futapar, our, our board chairman, is some meeting with the Japanese government, and she proposed there'd be a pooling of government rights uh, in the agreement. Uh, and that in order to join the pool, the government would have to do what you say, they'd have to put rights in the funding agreements in a field of use, uh, either step in or royalty free right or, or ownership. And they'd have to uh, uh, cross license those rights with other countries that did the same thing. And it would be sort of, she proposes like an opt-in mechanism so that you wouldn't have to join the pool, but if you did not join the pool, the rights would not apply to your jurisdiction and they'd have a geographic restriction. So you would either be in or out of the pool depending on the actions of your government, which would require the two things. The thing that you mentioned, you have to assert the rights and then second, you'd have to cross license the rights. What, what would you think of, of that approach? Because that actually gets to whether there'd be an incentive. Because people talk about mandates to do things and, and it's hard to do mandates in a treaty uh, at the WHO that are enforceable, but incentives uh, uh, is a different way, I think, of uh, thinking how things could play out. I, I'm sorry, I think I would need to look into this proposal further uh, to, but... Yeah, overall, that would be the next step, I would say. But for for this to be possible, you would need for already for all countries to keep this, this type of rights, right? Which that's, is that's correct. You, you which have is not the, which is not yeah. not even the, the case yet. And and you know that would that would enable much more countries to even just take uh, act or, or negotiate with companies uh, and and uh, without having necessarily to take to to make a re to UCL. Thank, th thank you. Brooke, you have your hand up, Professor Baker. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about number 10, uh, which is uh, subsection 10, which is the clinical trials. Um, I know it's not a transparency issue, but it's again, it's a ma major, major area of failure uh, in COVID in that, you know, 80 or 90% of the studies were, did not have sufficient uh, power to, to give good guidance on, on anything. Um, so there's huge wastage and, and, you know, the list of things that they want here in terms of some coordination and, you know, and reporting of results um, and disclosing uh, disaggregated information is all good from a, from a uh, you know, disclosure result. But what about trial design? Uh, there's nothing in here about uh, wanting comparative studies. There's nothing in here about wanting to be able to test uh, you know, for regimens as, as opposed to individual products. Um, there's nothing about inclusive participation and, and inclusive including regions in clinical trial studies. So uh, 
And particularly, we know that a lot of the studies have left out some key populations uh, that, you know, where we didn't get follow on information until substantially later. Um, we don't have anything about access to uh, sample products for purposes of conducting clinical trials and any obligations on, on right holders to give those samples uh, on an affordable basis. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and we allow the clinical trials to, to it's seemingly to always uh, be undertaken primarily by the innovators themselves uh, with all the potentials for conflict of interest uh, that arise from that. So, uh, so that's just on that one principle. But I mean, in, in a way, there should be, a, someone already said it, there should, should be a whole section on clinical trials, just like there should have been a whole section on regulatory processes. I mean, this this thing would be much better if it was organized kind of on the the life of a medicine from innovation through you know end use and and everything was addressed in, in terms of you know how medicines actually uh, move throughout the value chain and uh, value chain and 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 the clinical uh, use. I have a, a thank you, Professor uh, Baker. I, I have a, a three speakers lined up, and after they're through, I'd like to switch to benefit sharing, uh, which is a really important topic we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, the, the, the first is, is MOGA from People's uh, uh, Vaccine Alliance, followed by uh, Preti uh, from uh, Geneva Health uh, uh, um, letter. Geneva Health Files. <laughs> I got it wrong, I'm sure. And uh, Files and and Galerme uh, from IFPMA, but start, uh, MOGA. Um, just quickly on, on clinical trials, um, and in addition to transparency and all the issues we talked about, um, it is no, it seems, commitment to, you do clinical trials in South Africa without any commitment to provide the medicine or the vaccines to South Africans. Even the people who were like in the, um, the, the arm of the trial that didn't take the medicine. It is, uh, I find that it's just uh, 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 incredible. So I think there should be something about the right of people who participate in clinical trial or the right of the country that offers its people to participate in clinical trials. Because that I think clinical trials in the in the South are going to be more and more um, happening, particularly the naive patients and all that. But anyway, um, I think the right of people is is important. And that includes confidentiality and all these things. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, uh, Preeti? Hi, good afternoon. Thanks so much for organizing this. Um, I, I had actually um, a couple of questions for the experts here. Um, one is, of course, on um, wh whether you think that uh, the provisions on clinical trials um, are actually uh, strong. I don't, uh, a, a layperson's reading of it doesn't suggest that there are any uh, obligations per se. And uh, the second was on uh, trade secrets. Um, again, I think the draft uh, at the first reading seems uh, there isn't language on trade secrets at all. Is that something uh, you know uh, others can shed light on? And finally, on on um, uh, you know being transparent about contractual terms for public procurement, um, there is some mention. I think it's three B, um, but uh, we know that. Uh, this is gaining um, sort of uh, currency and importance in other forums, including at the EU. Uh, so do you think that this could, this could and should feature uh, in the zero draft in a more sort of forceful fashion? Thanks a lot. Thank you, Glerme from the IFPMA. Thank you, Jane. My uh, comment is on the conditionalities for public funding uh, linked to transparency. Uh, governments are free to impose uh, any conditionalities, they, they seem fit for public uh, policy reasons, uh, and they quite often do. Uh, and this is fine, and it's part of the choice of the company that wants to access those funds or procure uh, or partner with uh, biotech, for instance, that had access that to make the decision. Uh, what we are a little bit uh, cautious is once you take that to a global level and impose a one size fits all model, that all government contracts should look like that. Uh, you may lose a little bit of nuances and the needs of confidentiality or of uh, counterparts from the US may be very different than those of uh, a developing country. So that's all. Uh, thank you. Uh, now we're, I'm gonna move right now to uh, 
because we're it's eleven fifteen. Uh, we're in Washington D.C. Uh, uh, to to the beneficiary. Before I do, I uh, something I forgot to mention on the intellectual property provisions. There's there's two paragraphs that deal with efforts to make royalty free during a pandemic um, inventions in developing countries. And I just wanted to express our, our dissent on that in the sense that we, we think of royalties as a positive, not a negative, if there's a non-exclusive license. Our big problem is typically with the exclusivity, not with the royalty. Most of the medicines patent pool licenses have royalties in them. I think it, uh, one thing that's sort of often lacking on the equity provisions are incentives uh, uh, to, 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 to get people to do things. And I think eliminating royalties makes it harder to get people uh, to share uh, IP uh, during a pandemic. I'd like to go to benefit sharing now. I don't know if people have, uh, uh, how many people, I know a lot of people have opinions about this. Um, I know that uh, uh, my, my, my read on the, the text is it leaned a lot on the PIP framework. Are people here very familiar with the PIP framework? Uh, uh, it's a, uh, 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 the PIP framework was around influenza. And one of the critical things it has is a, 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 I'm gonna put in the chat here a link to it is a, 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 a standard material transfer agreement that companies uh, that want to get uh, uh, samples of, of influenza have to agree upon to be part of the the pandemic influenza preparedness framework for sharing influenza viruses and other benefits. There's also was a, a, a recent resolution, uh, at the WHO, which I also put a link to in the thing, uh, where <clears throat> this was addressed uh, at the WHO. It's not exactly the same. What you see in the uh, in the pandemic treaty uh, provision, but th there are, uh, like for example, the twenty percent options and things like that. Those are things that were, that were kind of lifted word for word, practically out of the PIP framework. Um, uh, the PIP framework gives people options if you share pathogens of things they can do and the 10% donation and the 10% kind of a regulated price uh, supplying um, uh, vaccines is, is, are among the options, but they're not the only options. And in the, in the, in the zero draft text on benefit sharing, this is a, uh, 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 this sort of, the sort of, you know, the, the, these options are set out. It's not the only options, but it's, it's, I was sort of expecting Gopa to raise his hand here, but I don't see him. Is he, is he left the call uh, through? Oh, Gopa's here. Uh, or if other people want to like weigh in on the benefit sharing parts of the, uh, of, of the provision. We, we, we have a, a, a little bit different take than some groups. We, we think that benefit sharing should be broad beyond pathogens to, to anything that you share. Uh, which should be, we think it should be, it should uh, and, and provide a different kind of an, um, uh, framework than what's proposed in the uh, PIP, uh, PIP framework or, or in, in the in zero draft. But I'd like to hear first some people that have worked a lot. I think on, Nitin is here. Um, um, oh, Gopa is there. Yes. Maybe. Oh, Gopa. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I think uh, Nitin can go, then I'll, I, I, I'll, I'll uh, supplement. Yeah. Thank you. That's quite, that's, uh, because I was not uh, expecting that. Uh, it's okay. Uh, I, I was trying to say uh, there are a few things uh, problematic here in uh, in Article Ten, uh, especially you know it, it uh, though it um, it clearly goes against the understanding of uh, of what Convention on Biological Diversity and the Bio Protocol wants to say that you establish obligation to share pathogens and uh, genetic sequence information. You know, uh, that's always under state sovereignty, it's under state discretion whether they have to share it or, or not. And why, why do I say that, you know, uh, uh, why is it important is, is that even with that discretion, you know, nobody is actually, uh, is, is, is not, has not stopped sharing or something of that sort. So, so what you have to understand is that whatever is happening, we are asking for a legal obligation. 
there is already a sharing of pathogen, sharing of the sequence information happening very widely. And that's been again asked for a legal obligation. Whereas what is not happening is benefit sharing. And that is put down into a future promise or into a negotiable agreement for later time. So that you know, understanding of transactionalizing benefit sharing and then obligating, making it obligatory and assured sharing of pathogens and sequence information. This is not acceptable way of uh, looking at uh, a good ABS mechanism. Uh, then going back to uh, option is an understanding. One thing which we have to understand is that, of course, there is a multilateral mechanism we are talking about in big framework as well as here, but uh, the kind of uh, monetary gains uh, has been, which has been made uh, by, the, by the companies or the manufacturers or the, or the business sector by, uh, by, uh, by, by commercializing the products which they develop using these pathogens and sequence information. A, a minimal share of it, you know, if that could finance a lot of uh, funding requirements of countries and uh, health systems strengthening it, many, many, many of that sort. And this could actually be transferred to developing countries. This could actually go to the countries. It, it, you can't just speak only about sharing of benefits back to WHO. You should also think about how the, how the money from the WHO goes to developing countries as well. So it's, it's important to see that there is a clear cut obligation uh, of benefits, not just going back to WHO, but from there further it percolating to developing countries as well. And there should be a clear specific mention of monitoring monetary benefits. And, uh, and a recently a uh, decision from COP15 uh, on, uh, has also as accepted the understanding of having benefit sharing for uh, DSI or the sequence information or benefit generated out of uh, sequence information. And uh, there is a, another negotiation going on uh, biodiversity from the law oceans. They're also, you know, a, a very bi vibrant provision on asking 2% uh, initially and then going up to 8% of monetary gains to be shared back uh, to the global mechanism or the multilateral mechanism. So it's, uh, uh, that's, that's something which is happening very widely. But if you look at the framework, it's not even 1%. So, so we have a good opportunity here to perhaps uh, 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 make uh, sources for finance as well as ensure some sort of uh, real transfer of technology and capacity building happens uh, uh, happens through it. And we, we do have obligations. So it's, it's just that you know, we just have to make it put into use in, rather than you know, uh, diluting it the, the way perhaps developed countries want. Yeah, that we should perhaps look at in a different way. Right. Thank you. That was that was really uh, <clears throat> uh, clear. Uh, Janice, uh, uh, you have your hand up from the former TDR. Yes. yes. Uh, I, I was curious on 10H. There is this access to uh, real time access to 20% production to WHO. Uh, that to me looks totally contraintuitive uh, in the case of an aggressive early prevention campaign, or also in relation to the global distribution of a pandemic. Uh, you know, if, if, if WHO is the mechanism that can access people where other organizations cannot, I mean, restricting to a given amount of production uh, will will probably leave them not fulfilled. I mean, why is this? Why is this twenty percent uh, so tightly defined? Oh, 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 I can tell you. It, 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 the reason it, Sarah is because it was just lifted word for word out of the practically out of the PIP framework. I think it was just sort of the agreed upon language that they took from PIP and they just paste it in here, but it's an option actually. It's not even an obligation. And I think the way it's written as I understand it is that uh, it's, not, it's not the only option you could pick. It's just, uh, you know, it's not, an, it's not presented as an obligation, but an option, which I think uh, you'd have to look at. Yeah, but talking, sorry, talking about, about a number will it, it could limit really the access and the impact of a product, because if 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 uh, you know you need more than the amount that the group produces for addressing a specific niche, uh, to me it's counterintuitive from a prevention campaign point of view. Okay. Um 
I'm going to move on to, uh, I'm going to come back to GOPA later, but before that, I'm, uh, I'm going to go to uh, Glarme from you, uh, from uh, uh, IFBMA, followed by uh, Jot, Professor Sarnoff, and Brooke, and then I'm going to come back to GOPA. So, uh, I, Glarme from IFBMA. Thank you, Jamie. Um, we, we're uh, still analyzing uh, that article, but uh, there is a little bit of caution. So we'd simply copy and paste the PIP model. The PIP is very specific to influenza and has never been tested in practice. And uh, the pandemic may be on any pathogens with very different models. So, but a more fundamental point for us is that uh, applying the concepts of CPD, um, be it digital or physical, to pathogens uh, is like inherently uh, wrong in the sense that uh, CBD is made for conservation of biological resources. Pathogens are biological resources we want to eradicate or highly control, and the logic simply doesn't flow, which doesn't mean that uh, the equity shouldn't be addressed. Uh, and perhaps this uh, accord is the place to address equity, but certainly not linked to the obligation of sharing pathogens. And uh, I kind of disagree with our colleague from TWN in the sense that there hasn't been examples of countries not sharing. We have seen in practice many cases of countries delaying or completely denying sharing of pathogens, not only to us, uh, that had led to concrete delay in research with concrete uh, harm to patients. I stop here. Uh, thank you. Uh, I Professor Sarnoff, followed um, by Professor Baker, followed by Gopa. So, Professor uh, Sarnoff? This is uh, similar to Guillermo's concern, and it really goes back to the decision to treat um, biological resources as uh, national property rather than as a world uh, heritage or a common resource of humanity. Um, it seems to me that the pandemic should make clear that um, you know, we have to provide access, but the condition for benefit sharing should be global. So again, tying it to a number is silly, tying it to demonstrated need or minimizing uh, spread or minimizing severity is the principle that should be adopted. Um, the money is a different question, but again, if we're gonna talk about money flow, Let's also talk about liability. You owned it. It's a you know ferry nature. You should have strict liability for having let it out. So I don't think any country actually wants to acknowledge that. But let's at least focus on the most important principle, which is global sharing for highest medical need should be the principle. And this is nowhere close. Uh, Professor Baker. I mean, I agree completely on the point of, on global sharing and um, and and treating uh, and you know the need for access. That's not you know pathogens not being held hostage to some transactional uh, in a transactional sense. Um, I, I think the twenty percent came from Act Accelerator as well. Um, you know, and and it really focuses on you know a so-called acute phase of a pandemic. And you know, the Act Accelerator was was started with the premise that you know, regular market interventions would suffice after uh, acute need was met. And I, I think the pandemic has exploded all such thinking about um, a so-called acute phase and, 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 and a parsimonious response to getting adequate supplies out to meet need as quickly as possibly and as equitably as possible. Um, and so, you know, I, I agree with people who are, are saying that we really ought to have, you know, the idea of equitable access to countermeasures untied to, you know, anything else. It should just be a fundamental principle uh, within the overall um, uh, agreement or treaty. Uh, uh, thanks, Professor Baker. Uh, Gopa? I think um, just uh, a piece of info, like, uh, you know, the uh, during the EB uh, discussions, uh, WHO revealed that uh, so far uh, the participatory contribution from pharmaceutical companies through the PIF framework is around $250 million and which has been used to build uh, capacities in developing countries. Uh, 
first is to Gizrit Labs and then also used during COVID um, a few activities, including Open WHO, et cetera. So uh, this has contributed uh, uh, in the pandemic uh, 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 response or when pandemic uh, preparatory work, when some of these uh, labs have been used for, you know, early days to uh, for diagnostic purposes, et cetera. So uh, what I'm saying is that there is a system which is working and uh, which proved useful. Mm, uh, so it is important to uh, expand that model mm, uh, to, uh, uh, to include uh, uh, public health emergencies of international concern uh, or as well as uh, pandemic. Uh, but the, uh, some of the nuances can be, uh, can be uh, differentiated or uh, can be much more uh, uh, worked out. Uh, but it is important uh, the system is working and uh, the system needs to expand now it include uh, under the IHR framework as well as the new instrument framework. And second, you know, nobody is asking for a, you know, uh, national level uh, benefit sharing, the money needs to be transferred, etc. If countries coming and setting up an uh, instrument at the international level, at the uh, WHO level, that shows that, uh, you know, uh, the there is a, um, a willingness uh, uh, to uh, <coughs> share and but it needs to be uh, it needs to be uh, reciprocated with some kind of obligation so now uh, there is only an ob uh, obligation which is working is to share this uh, that's on moral ground there, though there is no legal framework to compulsory share it but on a uh, you know public health also needs all these samples to have an effective response but there is nothing on the value addition to share that benefit with the um, forget about the monetary benefit even not share with the uh, details of the product so even the localized production can happen so uh, this needs to be changed um, so the system which uh, the pip is really working and uh, it shows that it can be expanded yeah but currently the text also last comment on the text text is promising everything on you know for a future date even on smta it refers who is going to draft the smta there is no smta in the text right so it's basically the secretariat is going to work on smta that is completely uh, unacceptable it should be a member driven process and um, also who also has you know moved so far uh, all these uh, who pandemic hub in geneva uh, in in switzerland and a, a epidemiological intelligence hub in Geneva, etc. It is in, uh, sorry, in Berlin. These are all about sharing uh, of uh, pathogens, right? Without any corresponding obligation to share benefit. So this is completely unacceptable and it's a complete violation of the international law. So that needs to be changed first. Uh, I have a uh, uh, from TWN. Yeah, sorry, I, I just sorry wanna... to take the floor again. Oh, yeah. no, go, go ahead, Jim. Well, I... <clears throat> I was going to ask if, if, if you, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the open source dividend, but I can do it before or after you, you, you talk and what, what do you I'm, prefer? I'm sorry, I just want to step in and, uh, and speak about two things uh, uh, regarding the access part of it. You were talking more about benefit sharing. So, uh, so the technology is, as far as I understand, uh, is, is, uh, is advanced that you know, perhaps you don't have to actually do the cross-border data transfer. You, you can hold back the data back within your country and allow access to data, right? So, so sometimes the, the, uh, the requirement to transfer data to publicly owned databases, which is a very interesting idea of open science, but you need to check where the, the physical storage of those data banks are actually uh, established and who's controlling those physical spaces, for example, as well as even where, where the locations of the uh, uh, laboratories are and where they, where they are connected to, uh, uh, I would say, military facilities or uh, defense facilities. Uh, so where are you actually transferring these uh, pathogens or uh, data? So even with, uh, with regard to, if you go back to CBD, one of the, one of the ways of uh, accessing uh, path, uh, materials is to perhaps go to the place where it is and then set up uh, a research and the scientific process out there. And uh, also, it's a very interesting understanding, which is uh, which is written by very scholar, important scholars in CBD that uh, providing access to sequence information is one way of uh, providing access to the material itself. So, you know, so the the, the, the distinction between sharing of uh, sequence information, pathogens, these are sometimes not really very much warranted 
in, a, in, in an instrument like this. So it's, it's sometimes very important to think about, uh, uh, about access part of it, whether we do need to, do need, really need to transfer it, you know, physically send it to some place or some place kind of thing or cross-border data transfer, is that actually required? That's something, some question which uh, we have to perhaps uh, look into when we look into this particular issues. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a, a, a comment, a uh, request from uh, Patrick Goodish, who hasn't spoken yet from uh, Public Eye. Patrick? Thank you, Jamie. Uh, I, um, I have two points. One is, is, is a concern about some language that is contained in 10.3D, which basically, which basically says that there should be no claim on, on IP uh, to, to pathogens to pathogens with pandemic potential or their genomic sequences or components in the form received. So that means that if you slightly change it, you may claim IP and depending on how the claims are framed, you may end up with, with, with protecting uh, several genomic sequences. So, so that's for me a concern. The other aspect, if I, if I, I I'm trying to remember about the, the, the PIP framework negotiations uh, 10 years back, I was there also. And uh, in terms of benefit sharing, I, I remember there was a discussion about including some IP issues also in the benefit sharing, either in terms of pooling in exchange of accessing pathogens or uh, any sort of open licensing uh, related to to the fact that uh, related to the access of these of of this pathogen, so I'm I'm not seeing this. I'm just seeing, uh, and this was the the short list that was retained at the end of the negotiations in order for the agreement to pass through. Is just a a percentage of product of products at WHO stockpiling, and that's it. So I think it could be a bit more ambitious and basically also address the issue of, of, of sharing pooling IPs. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I'd like to, uh, that was really, really helpful, Patrick. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to sort of explain the open source dividend approach. Instead of a, an obligation, it's more of an incentive. It, it is an obligation in one sense. The proposal is that people that would sell uh, pandemic countermeasures over a certain threshold of you know, sales would have to pay a percentage, either as a tax or a royalty or something like that, into a fund. Uh, and that money would go back to people that openly shared things that made the countermeasure possible. So those things that would be shared would be data, sequences, pathogens, samples, cell lines, inventions, uh, great scientific papers and advances and stuff like that. So the idea is that you, you care about people sharing all sorts of things, not just pathogens. You care about, we, we definitely want people to, to share inventions. We want access to cell lines and we want all these other things. And yet we don't really give people any money. We just give them like a pat in the, pat in the back if they, if they share these things openly. And so the idea would be to have society actually have a mechanism to pay and reward people economically that did the kind of sharing the society valued in the first place. And the money would come from the sale of products that were possible because of the ideas, data, pathogens, cell lines, everything like that that, that were shared. So I, I put in a link, uh, one of the submissions we made to the INB earlier on in the negotiations. I will say that the idea of an open source dividend has been involved in, a, in, in some bills introduced in the US Congress in connection with broader reforms on delinkage, even though it's a, a standalone idea. And it's also been involved in, in proposals by Bolivia, Barbados, Bangladesh, and, um, and, uh, uh, Suriname. and Suriname to the WHO in earlier negotiations on, on sort of uh, IP reform. Now in their proposals, some of the proposals would say they would like to share as much as 10% of the sales on a product uh, to people that did the open sharing that made the development of like say a, 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 a new drug for Chagas disease or a TB diagnostic or something like that available. And the original idea for the open source dividend came about 
when MSF had proposed a price for uh, a low cost test for, for tuberculosis. And in the, in the conversation over the proposal by, by MSF for a TB prize, a very big one of like $100 million, some academics said that the problem with prize incentives is it encourages people uh, to go with trade secrets instead of uh, publishing their data as a patent because you didn't need a patent to get the prize money. So they thought that people would just not even you know, disclose anything, that they would just all operate under trade secrecy, which people thought was negative. So the open source dividend was, was initially proposed in the context of this MSF project as a, as a counter uh, incentive uh, to make uh, uh, greater openness uh, uh, you know, in response to this criticism that the prize was pushing people towards secrecy. And, uh, but then I think as people looked at the open source dividend, they began to see it had kind of a, a broader utility in incentivizing openness and sharing of all sorts of things. And I think if you, if you move the conversation beyond just pathogens, you find a pretty broad constituency for this, this sharing of the benefits of openness. And, and that constituency is, is a ton of people who are academics and small businesses and governments and people like that that have something to share that's not really a product, but it's something that might enable a product uh, down the road. I, I, I talked about this in the World Vaccine um, uh, Congress in Barcelona uh, uh, not that long ago. And the audience was really, really excited about the idea that, you know, that, 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 that you know, that something like that might be possible because a lot of these guys were academic researchers or people from, from firms where they thought that, you know, they might be beneficiaries of this kind of thing. It would be it would have been a lot of money during COVID, obviously. So it, I just wanted to uh, to mention the open source dividend as a sort of way of broadening the idea of benefit sharing to to, to more than just pathogens. I don't see any hands up. We're uh, past the there time. Was, maybe there was just a comment, by the way, just confirming uh, from one of our participants, Marion Carga Hines um, from Barbados, and she confirmed that indeed it was Bangladesh, <laughs> Barbados, Bolivian, Suriname that proposed this. I guess uh, during the Igwig negotiations. Absolutely, and 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 really, um, uh, it was it was <laughs> it was really. Uh, uh, important the work that they did on this and it's been overlooked often uh, I think uh, and if people should go, go back and look at some of the proposed that I think that in general a lot of uh, attention in the pandemic treaty is how you create like you know, binding obligations or you know make things harder or you know stuff like that and not enough talk is about how you create incentives for people to do what you want them to do and uh, 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 I, there's a lot of work to be done on the negotiations, but I, I just hope that people uh, reflect a bit, uh, uh, not just on the obligations you want, but uh, it, why would, you know, how you can get people to do things that are really kind of hard to get them to do, like, like sharing technology and things like that. Uh, now we're, we're past uh, the, the allotted time for when we're supposed to close out the conversation. Um, uh, <clears throat> And I, I'd like to wind up the meeting, but if, if, if people have something they'd like to say before we close, I'd like to give them an opportunity right now. Professor uh, Baker, you have your hand up. I just urge people to follow the establishment of the uh, medical countermeasures platform that's being undertaken by um, the Facilitation Council of the ACT Accelerator, the uh, sponsors of its independent evaluation with seemingly support from WHO and other entities. Um, it's, it's addressing many of the issues that are relevant to this treaty, but proposes to actually set up such a platform by this coming September, well in advance of any uh, final agreements on the, um, on, on the treaty itself. And in many respects would replicate some of the errors of the ACT Accelerator, not the least of which is absolutely no attention whatsoever to intellectual property issues in its initial concept note, um, but, but many other important issues as well. And, and just to, to, to say that, you know, the idea that such a platform is, is being established, obviously we, we want good thinking to, to be taken uh, on, on a number of things and not just to have everything weighed on the treaty, 
but uh, it's deeply distressing that it's if it's simply a, a re reincarnation of act accelerator under a, another name that that's deeply problematic and there's a lot of people on this call with relevant expertise who can give hopefully constructive inputs to try to change um, the, the momentum that's behind the establishment of such a platform. Thank you, Professor. Ellen Tahone, I'm gonna give you the last word. <laughs> thank you. I just want to thank you for organizing this. This was really very, very interesting and I think extremely useful. And I would like to propose that we hold such sessions uh, regularly as the, 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 the formal talks uh, progress to sort of outside the, the, the context of the IMB have this very free and frank exchange. I, I enjoyed it tremendously and I think it's really very worthwhile to do. So thank you, KI, for having done it. <laughs> thank you very much, Alan, for those kind words. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, let everyone get back to their next Zoom call right now. <laughs> So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Jamie. Bye. Bye.